Welcome back, honors. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom. Actually, I probably shouldn't say welcome back. This is your very first flip ever. So actually, welcome to your flip classroom. Very first flip ever. My name is Mr. Terry. It was a pleasure meeting all of you today. Absolutely awesome. Shout out to a couple of kids that really stood out because they were just willing to like participate and get after it. Claire, Cortez, McCann, right? Marcella, Kinsey also, right? As she is known on the street. Really great job today, all right? Was very, very impressed. So the big thing about it, though, is welcome to your very first flip lesson. This is going to be kind of like the crux or the archetype or the cookie cutter or whatever that you use going forward because you'll have one of these pretty much every single night, right? About every single night, and all you got to do, right, exactly like what we talked about in class, is just take notes, right? Like, just take notes if you would normally in class of the things that we're going to be talking about. If I sound like I'm really, really emphasizing something a little bit extra than I normally would, Jot it down real quick, right? If I seem like I'm bringing up something that might actually appear as like extra credit on the test, jot that down. But just like you would normally in class, we're just going to be chatting about history and getting after it. And then tomorrow, during your very first real warm-up, right, the one that we, of course, didn't get a chance to actually go over at all this year because 30 minutes is not a lot of time for Mr. Terry to do a lot. So, But the big thing about it, though, is it's like, excuse me, during that very, very first warm-up, we're going to be, I'm going to be coming around, checking your flips, so just make sure that you're there thorough, the notes are done well, and that I can actually make sure and double check that you were actually watching, right? So the big thing about it, though, is, is let's go ahead and start off with the course as a whole, right? Welcome to Honors Western Civilizations, right? You are now currently in what's known as a West Civ class, right? And so big thing that we need to understand, though, before we can go any further, is what does that mean, right? So like, what does that mean? Because a lot of people might actually usually call this world history, or they might call it by a different name. We refer to it here at Chappelle as Western Civilizations, right? And a lot of that has to do with me, Mr. Terry, because I took a look at like the Louisiana State curriculum and stuff like that, and I was like, you know, kids aren't really learning about this, and they don't get a really big chance to go about that. And then so I asked like people like Miss Pansvecchia, can I design something that's more of a West Civ course, right? Something that's a little bit more all-encompassing and more about the ideas of the Western civilizations modalities because that's kind of the direction that the state curriculum lended itself to. Anyway, so the big thing about that, that some of you are probably like, West Civ, what is that? Where is that? I don't know. Up is down, black is white, blah. Like, so the thing about it going into it, Western civilizations is a word that we can actually take about two seconds to break down real quick. Okay? So when we're looking at the word Western, when we're talking about the progression of history, we are talking about a fundamental split or shift in societies, right? So there's some stuff that we're going to talk about today where like human history kind of broke itself up into new sections and then we ended up being able to do this or that and we did this differently than we used to, blah, blah, blah. But somewhere along the line, after civilizations began to be established, right, or after communities began to be established and after history began to be recorded in a much larger way, there was an intricate split or separation between the East and the West that occurred. Now, this line is not a hard line. It's actually a very, very blurry line, to say the least, because there are certain areas of the world that aren't really included in either East or West, right? But what you would consider the United States of America, Europe, um, some parts of Northern Africa, uh, Latin America, areas like that, you would consider them Western civilizations. And the word Western has nothing to do with the ideas of the direction, right? Because, like, for example, some people might say that are certain areas that are actually very far to the east have a Western-style culture, right? For example, elements of different, like, groups and countries and places like that have more Western-style culture. So it's not necessarily dependent on direction. What it refers to is the split between societies that occurred several hundred thousand years ago to actually kind of create two different distinct culture sets. The eastern ones, right, are going to be much more like, well, actually, we'll get into that here in a minute. West, though, refers mostly to any society that originated around the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the Mediterranean is the sea that separates Europe and North Africa, right? When you think of Italy, that it looks like a boot and stuff like that, it juts out into the Mediterranean Sea. So Western civilizations predominantly started around the Mediterranean, and then they kind of began to permeate up into the rest of Europe, and then Europe eventually later on is going to go off and colonize and make like create new territories abroad and over the oceans as well, extending their reach and their grasp. So in the long run, when you look at a Western Civ class, it's basically a history of Europe class and its effects on the rest of the world, right? So the thing about it that you need to understand is that we're going to be like pretty much interacting mostly with Western-style civilizations and how they impacted the rest of the world, right? We're going to talk about things that happened in Italy, things that happened in France, Germany, England, Russia, and we will talk a lot as well about how those countries then affected places like America, Africa, Asia, and other different like like um, ethnicities and territories and other like different like things as well along the line or along the way. Now, going forward though, 
Civilizations is another word that you need to understand really quickly, because before we can really get into the grasp of the splitting of these two different groups and how we became Western versus Eastern and stuff like that, you have to also know what a civilization is, right? It refers to the concentration of sedentary societies formed after the end of the Paleolithic period. Wow, there's a lot of words in that definition that some of y'all probably don't know what it means, right? But notice I have sedentary and like all but big letters, right? Which means that they don't move anymore, that they're in one spot. I also have another one on there that says Paleolithic period, which some of y'all are probably like, I don't speak Greek, so I don't know what that means, right? So going into it though, let's kind of go ahead and do some background work so we can understand that definition of civilizations just a little bit better, right? So when did all of this start? Like when we're talking about like history in general, where it all began, right? Where it's all going. There was a question on your warm up that some of you might have actually got to today. We just didn't get a chance to review it, of course. That was asking, what's the point of studying history, right? But the real point that it, like a lot of people will tell you, like, oh, so we don't repeat our mistakes. We, we repeat our mistakes all the time, right? Like so, like it happens constantly. You can't predict the future. The best thing that you can do with history is study the past so we can understand why the modern day exists the way that it does, right? Why does this current era? exist in the way that it does. Why do we speak English in America, right, when England is really far away? Why does, like, Mexico, that's right to our southern border, speak Spanish instead of English as well, right? There's a lot of things that we can do using historical analysis to understand things like that a little bit better, right? So when we're trying to describe what a civilization is, you got to go all the way back to human history in totality, right? So the thing about it is that the Earth itself is about 4.5 billion, with a B, billion years old, right? The Earth itself, this rock that we are hurting hurtling through space on, right? At thousands of miles an hour, we are moving right now, and literally, it's 4.5 billion years old, right? But human beings have only existed, or homo sapiens anyway, have only existed for about 300,000 years. Now, in essence, for a much longer period of time, much greater than 300,000 years, over a million years, some type of of hominid has existed, right? There were these things called Australopithecus and stuff like that, which is the very, very first human style ape, right, that popped up, and that animal eventually evolved into Homo sapiens. Some of you, for example, in your earlier classes in middle school might have heard of a skeleton that was actually discovered in the 1970s that was actually by the name went by the name of Lucy. They found like a Australopithecus skeleton outside of Ethiopia, right, <clears throat> in Africa, and that's where we believe human beings actually came from originally as Africa. We're going to get to that here in about two seconds. But the big thing about it is they discovered like this, this set of bones and they named her Lucy. And she is one of the very first ape-like creatures that evolved later on into what you now know of as Homo sapiens, right? But we've only been around for about 300,000 years. So to kind of try and understand the impact that human beings have made on the Earth in totality, if you imagine that the timeline of Earth or the timeline of this planet that we're on was the size of a football field, how much of this football field do you think would be taken up by human history, right? The thing about it is, y'all, it's crazy. It would be the last blades of grass before the opposite end zone, right? So we, in a football field's worth of time, are only as important as a blade of grass because that's about how much time we've been here, right? Such a small amount by comparison to the planet itself, right? And even when that occurred about 300,000 years ago when Homo sapiens popped up from the evolutionary line of hominids going from Australopithecus to Homo habilis to Homo erectus to then eventually Homo sapiens, well, actually, we're technically Homo sapiens sapiens, but we're not going to get into that right now. The thing about it, though, is we believe that the continent that the earliest human beings existed on was all the way back in a place called Africa, right? Not a place called Africa. Africa, you know of Africa, the continent of Africa, right? We believe that all human beings originated from the sub-Saharan, sub-Sahelian area of Africa, right? This area down here. And what's eventually going to happen, though, is migration, right? And occurring literally after the origin of Homo sapiens, around 300,000 years, we're going to start seeing the movement of people out of these different areas, right? They're going to begin to move and migrate to different areas of the world, and they're going to spread their influence and their settlements even further, right? So as we can see, this is going to happen very slowly, but it's going to progress throughout all of history, populating almost every single continent, right? So as you can see right there, about 300,000 years ago, the out of Africa theory shows us that eventually humans began to start moving, right? Well, movement is very, very key when it comes to understanding human time periods and human history, right? So time periods are essential when you're ever studying your, uh, when you're studying history in general, especially Western civilizations, because we're dealing with such large civilizations that span thousands of years, right? 
So we break that stuff down into time periods to make it a little bit more manageable, right? Kind of like chapters in a book. So when you're really looking at human history in totality, when you're looking at Homo sapiens and their impacts on the entire world, you break it down into two basic time periods, right? And those two different time periods are called the pa Paleolithic period, which is of course was back in that civilization description, and the Neolithic period, right? And civilizations truly begin to start when the Paleolithic ends and the Neolithic begins. But to understand the difference between those two time periods, we need to talk about that first one a little bit, the Paleolithic, before we go any further. So those original hominids, those original human beings, the Homo sapiens, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, all those guys that originated in Africa originally, would have been alive originally during that Paleolithic time period, right? And the way these people would have lived is they would not have had civilizations or settlements or cities or anything like that. They were actually what you would refer to as nomadic, right? And nomadic means that they actually moved around from place to place to find food, right? They would follow their prey. So what they would actually do, though, is movement every single little place, right? And every single, all these different areas, they would move gradually with their prey and follow along with it, right? And they formed what's known as hunter-gatherer societies, right? People began to come together and realize that cooperation is one of the best ways for evolution to really kind of favor you, right? Turns out, apparently, the friendlier an animal is and the more it works together, with other living things, it is gangbusters for evolution, right? And it really, really helps out in a big way. So human beings began to get, create themselves into family units and eventually tribes that were mobile and nomadic, and they formed hunter-gatherer societies, right? Hunter-gatherer is pretty simple. You hunted and gathered to find sustenance and food, right? Now, in these societies, in Paleolithic times, in Paleolithic time periods, we saw some of the earliest things that make us human begin, right? Like, so, like, which is really, really important. It began to differentiate us from other mammals and other animals and things like that, and began to show a sophistication of human beings during the Paleolithic period, including some of the following things, like number one, gender division of labor, which this actually does exist in some other mammals, for example, lions and prides have like gender visions of labor. But the big thing about it though, when we're looking at human beings, you began to see that the, like, that the uh, like males were hunters and the females were primarily medicine makers, gatherers, and caregivers, right? And so that was your split of hunter-gatherer societies, right? But you saw a gender division of labor, as in males had a certain jobs and females had a certain job. But the the thing is, is that those two jobs were equal and kept everyone alive. Right? So there was no kind of like above or below. There was no difference in social social status in Paleolithic people. Right. Also, you're going to see the origin of early language. Now, this is something that heavily separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom, is that we began to create ways of communication with one another. Right. We believe that these hunting groups, right, these male hunting groups actually started pointing at things or using verbal things like signals to signal to one another when the game might be close. You know what I'm saying? And that literally led to the origin of language. And you also even saw Paleolithic people began to practice early religion. Now this is huge, okay? Paleolithic people, not Neolithic people, started the religion game first, right? And we see that in finding some of their burial sites, right? Turns out that we have Paleolithic burial sites that have been found where they would bury their dead with objects and trinkets or little things that they valued in their life, giving some semblance to our belief that they wanted to protect the body because they may have believed in some type of afterlife, right? So we believe the earliest forms of religion actually began with Paleolithic people. And another big thing that you saw was the creation of art, right? Art was a big thing that Paleolithic people created as well. Cave drawings and paintings and simple art was in a form of expression in even early Paleolithic people. Now the gears begin to get changed though several thousand years ago, right? Because something happens right here. Something really big stops the Paleolithic period and begins the Neolithic period, right? And what do you think it was? What do you think the thing that made people stop being old Stone Age into new Stone Age people? By the way, just because I did forgot to go over this a second ago, Paleolithic people is Greek, or Paleolithic is Greek for old Stone Age. The word paleo means old, lithic means new, or Stone Age, right? So Paleolithic, old Stone Age people, right? The former way of doing things, they're gonna stop existing when something major happens. And what do you think was invented that is going to actually create this movement, this shift? It's something very simple. Something you might not even guess, but if you guessed it, I'm gonna be impressed. It's the invention of farming. About 8,000 years ago, farming was invented, okay? Now some of you are all like, I feel like farming is a pretty simple invention. Surprising thing about it is, it took human beings a long time to figure it out, right? The invention of farming is gonna be major and it's gonna stop the Paleolithic period, and so begin the Neolithic. It's also referred to as the agricultural revolution that occurred in about 8,000 BC when human beings began to actually create farms. And why is this such a huge deal, right? Why is this such a major deal that began to take us from nomadic, like hunter-gatherer societies into sedentary societies? 
Well, it's a big deal because it had several positive outcomes for the growth of humanity, right? Including plant and animal domestication, which we will talk about in class and elaborate on that further. I love talking about plant and animal domestication, but basically what ended up happening is humans trained animals and plants to serve their needs, right? Which is a very big thing, and it's going to give them the ability to avoid large-scale famines. Famines still happened all the time, but you understand what I'm saying? It made it easier to live, right? It also created surpluses, which is a big deal as well. What a surplus is, is enough food to last you even through hard months and winters and bad seasons, right? It also created villages and concentrations because the thing about farming is you can't keep moving around and being nomadic if you have to farm, right? Because you have to keep everything in one location, right? So it actually created literally concentration, villages. It led to the earliest settlements, right? It also created specialized jobs because the thing about it is, as you can tell, if you have domesticated animals, domesticated plants, you only need a couple of people to farm. So what are the people that are not going to farm going to be doing? They're going to actually create specialized jobs, right? It leads to the growth of things like artisans, right? Who actually would make pots or smith, like, like smith metal later on, or have another type of job to add to the societal flow right trade is going to increase as well certain different like if you have one village here and the village down the road y'all might have goods that the other one doesn't have and you can swap them around right and it's going to lead to the like growth of economics and economies it's also going to lead to the growth of writing and even a further growth of art as well. Now, writing was really really important and it popped up in ancient civilizations because they needed an ability to record farm goods and they needed to be able to keep track of all that stuff. Now the thing about it that we need to understand though is that Jared Diamond, one of my favorite evolutionary biologists, does have a famous theory where he says that he thinks that the invention of farming might have been the worst thing that ever happened for the human race, right? Because it did have some negative outcomes, right? Negative outcomes include social differentiation, which means different social classes, right? So like after the creation of farming, you saw the creation of like the wealthy and the poor or the governing and the governed, right? Which is a very, very kind of Mm, sad thing. Economic inequality plays into that completely as well. Disease is going to be a big one that we'll talk further about tomorrow, but literally a lot of the diseases that you know of today are literally a product of the invention of farming, okay? Poorer nutrition as well as because what ended up happening is people and human beings began to eat less meat and vegetable matter and they began to eat a lot more of something else grains, right? Grains and cereals and breads, right? And the thing about it is bread is really, really great for caloric intake, but it's not really good when it comes to a lot of your essential vitamins, minerals, and nutrition. And also, here's the big one that you need to highlight. It's really, really sad and pathetic, but what also happened as a result of the actual agricultural Neolithic Revolution is women lost a lot of rights. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that, remember, in Paleolithic time periods, they were the gatherers, the caregivers, and the medicine makers, right? Well, what happened when the agricultural revolution came around is men took that job of, like, gathering slash farming, so their job wasn't needed as much anymore. And they were then usually pushed to a more, like, caregiver-only status, right? Leading to a subjugation of women a loss of rights throughout time, right? So now going forward, though, what's going to end up happening is after the agricultural revolution occurs, you're going to see the growth of villages. Those villages will then grow into towns. Those towns will then grow into cities. Those cities grow into civilizations. And you see the dawn of civilizations after several thousand years, right? And the characteristics of a civilization are very, very simple. You have the concentration of people, right? As in a bunch of people in one spot. Complex religions, right, which is a really big deal because this is the thing that kind of creates the difference between a civilization and just like a town or a village. Civilizations is large scale, right? When you think of like, for example, ancient Egypt, that's a civilization, right? When you think of like Metairie, that's just like a town, you know what I mean? Like, so like the thing about it though is this concentration or a grouping of people, complex religions, it also had a political or military structure, right? For example, you had rulers or the ruling classes and then you had the people that were ruling over, right? Or a military and structures like that. Social classes as well are gonna pop up in civilizations, which is a really, really big downfall because you're gonna have the wealthy and the elite versus the poor working classes. Writing will be a thing that divides civilizations and art and intellectual activity, right? And the thing about it when we're talking about all this stuff is when you're looking at the growth of civilizations, the one that's the first Western one, or creates itself as the very first Western civilization, which we'll really get into tomorrow, is that of ancient Greece, right? And ancient Greece is that very first Western civilization to have all of these different things inside of them that creates them as the first kind of hardcore, gung-ho, like, you know, large-scale civilization in the West anyway, okay? And I love talking about ancient Greece. I'm super excited to start that unit with y'all, and I'll see y'all then. Y'all have a good